The most common aspect of an abusive relationship, besides the abuse itself, is victim blaming. Tied together with victim blaming is the psychological concept of the fundamental attribution error. This is a common cognitive bias that can be best understood in a 2x2 two two table. Essentially, the fundamental attribution error attributes a person's outcome based on either individual personality traits or on external circumstances depending on whether the outcome is good or bad, and depending on whether that person is you or me. If something bad happens to me, I'm more likely to blame external circumstances. If something bad happens to you, I'm more likely to blame your personality traits. For example, if I'm a foreigner learning your language and I make a grammar mistake, I am likely to explain that mistake by saying that I'm tired today. My mental fog from lack of sleep is to blame. Or, I might even say that your language is just too illogical, essentially blaming the language itself. However, if you were to make a mistake in my language, I would be naturally biased toward explaining it as a lack of your ability to learn languages or retain information. After all, my language is easy enough for me to understand. This paradigm reverses for good outcomes. If I were to perform well in my job, gaining praise from the boss, I am likely to attribute it to my intellect and hard work. But you, my coworker, receiving the same praise? Well, you didn't really deserve that praise. You must be all buddy-buddy with the boss or something. The entire fundamental attribution error is exacerbated when it comes to violent domestic abuse. The violence is never the abuser's fault. It's always the result of external circumstances arising from the victim's negative personality traits. No matter how logically you explain the situation, the abuser will never take responsibility for his or her actions. As alas, the responsibility always falls on the victim by means of mental gymnastics fueled by the fundamental attribution error. Indeed, a domestic abuser is, in simple terms, a control freak. The so-called control freak feels compelled to point out and punish others for what he sees as mistakes flaws, or transgressions. He always knows what is best for you, and the end justifies the means, resulting in brainwashing and aggression. If you hear these descriptions and are naturally inclined to think of the n-word, narcissist, you are not all that far from the truth. However, narcissists and control freaks differ to an easily understandable degree once we return to that 2x2 two two chart. A narcissist is entirely me-oriented. The bulk of his mental energy is spent on thinking of how great he is and how the plights of his life are not the fault of his own. And I did nothing wrong. I did absolutely nothing wrong. I did everything right. I, I did nothing wrong. I did everything correct. So let's recap this situation. <clears throat> I did nothing wrong, okay? In contrast, a control freak is focused on the bad outcome quadrants of the 2x2 two two chart. Just as the narcissist does, the control freak spends much of his mental energy disassociating himself from any wrongdoing. But unlike the narcissist, a large portion of mental energy is also spent on thinking about negative outcomes that come from external circumstances, which is why he feels the need to enact so much control over his surroundings. I'm reminded of a woman who was in one of my group projects in college. One day, when we were working in the library, she found the need to excuse herself every hour on the hour to make a phone call to her boyfriend. She said that she needed to check in or he would get angry. I eventually asked her whether she thought that this is part of a normal relationship. Her response was that her boyfriend is just making sure nothing bad happens. I was pretty taken aback because what does her boyfriend expect to be happening during a group project? What bad thing could be happening? So as I got to know her over the months, I realized she was probably being quite strictly controlled by her boyfriend and likely being manipulated to some extent. I cannot imagine not just receiving but expecting a phone call from my wife every hour. I simply wouldn't be productive in such a scenario. This is likely why, despite the stereotype of control freaks being prominent in upper management, 
The control freak typically is not a very productive member of society. The anxiety a control freak experiences in his day-to-day -day life, worrying about all the possible negative outcomes from each contact he has and each action he makes, is a huge interference to his life quality. A narcissist at least has many positive thoughts about the future, even if those thoughts are delusional. A control freak is focused almost entirely on the negative. As we move into our subject of interest, consider the following personality traits of a domestic abuser employing the fundamental attribution error and with control freak tendencies. First, he's always the victim. In negative situations, his actions are not actually his actions. He was instead impelled by others to act in a negative way. He believes that every interaction with a disagreement, one person is wrong and the other is right. Unsurprisingly, if he is involved, he is always in the right. He fakes empathy for the victim, making compassionate statements that completely betray his actions. He focuses on the reasons for his actions while avoiding discussing the actions themselves. In a police interrogation, this is easily seen, as he spends most of his time attempting to justify the violence in spite of police asking questions about the specifics of the violent acts. He brings up unrelated negative personality traits of the victim so as to characterize the victim as inherently bad, thereby making himself look good due to being in a relationship with a flawed individual. He acts entitled. In most cases, this results in the control freak placing great emphasis on the victim not adhering to his wants and desires. He gaslights the listener on the sanity of the victim. In cases where the control freak is male, this can break down to a uh, women are just crazy, am I right, situation essentially downplaying the agency of the woman involved. If you pay close attention to this police interrogation, you will find all of these aspects in the statements of the suspect in our subject today. This is the case of Marvin Williams, not the basketball player, but the murderer of an innocent hairdresser, his on and off girlfriend, Cassandra Valentine. This is a woman with a service-based career spanning several decades by which she undoubtedly had gained many regular customers whom she lent her ear. She was also a beloved aunt and sister. She was a fan of football and she made a mean shrimp and grits according to her nephew. Overall Cassandra is almost certainly a net benefit to society and the world was robbed of her prematurely. Let's give her a moment of silence. On Monday, January 22nd, 2018, Cassandra's sister received a text message and recording from Cassandra. The content of the text and recording is not public knowledge, but it was concerning enough to prompt Cassandra's sister to contact the police to request a welfare check on Cassandra. Upon arriving at Cassandra's residence, the police found Cassandra. She had been stabbed to death. With a total of four stab wounds, one in the stomach and three in the neck, it was obvious to police that this was a murder. Cassandra was cohabitating with her boyfriend, Marvin Williams, who was not present at the time the police had arrived. Marvin had a history of domestic assault with Cassandra. Five years prior to this incident, Marvin was charged with felony domestic assault and false imprisonment. The latter meaning, essentially, she was held against her will. As a result, he was put on probation for four years, which should have set him free by this point. However, due to violating the stipulations of his probation, Marvin was put on extended parole. Hence, the police had a suspect with a criminal record directly tied to Cassandra and under parole. They set out immediately to find him, engaging social media in their search and offering a reward of $3,000. Soon after, the police were tipped off via social media that Marvin was working on a construction site at Baptist South Medical Center. 
When the police arrived, Marvin fled, prompting the police to chase. He fled to the parking lot of a nearby hotel, where he was promptly arrested. The Jacksonville Sheriff's Office announced Marvin's capture. In typical police fashion, no mention was made of the $3,000 award, of course, and at least to my tweet at them, the Jacksonville Sheriff's Office declined to comment on this matter. In the end, Marvin was taken in for questioning, and what follows is his interaction with the Jacksonville police. All right, Marvin, this is uh, Detective Deborah. Go on, As I said, I'm Detective Zilla. Can somebody please tell me what's going on? Can somebody please tell me what's going on? Is perhaps one of the worst initial statements that can be made to the police in a situation in which you know you've committed a crime. First of all, this statement tells the police that your plan is to feign ignorance, meaning that any subsequent statements showing that you have knowledge of the event can be easily used against you. Any indication that your ignorance is not genuine is tantamount to a lie, and will certainly harm you in court. Secondly, feigning ignorance immediately puts the police on the offensive. From here, the police only need to show that they have evidence that goes counter to your supposed lack of knowledge. Had Marvin resisted his impulse to say something as the detectives entered the room, the job of the detectives would have been much more difficult. As it stands now, the detectives have a simple goal set for themselves at the outset. Show that Marvin knows more than he claims. We'll get through all that, uh, but first we're going to start out, we'll read your rights real quick, and then we'll, we'll talk, okay? Okay. Do you have any kind of understanding of why you're here today? No, I don't. Nothing's happened recently while we would be wanting to talk to you? Uh, no, sir. Because Marvin had made the statement that he was unaware of his reason for being detained prior to being read his rights, the detectives attempt to get Marvin to repeat his claim that he doesn't know why he's being arrested. The attempt is successful. If Marvin were really unaware for the reason of being questioned by the police, the natural response would be to inquire as to what happened. Instead, he's acting in the same way that most guilty suspects act, directly answering the questions of the detectives, which basically puts him in deep water because he gives a lot of superfluous details. An innocent suspect would most likely not engage in a seemingly perpetual answer and question session, but would instead, at the very least, interrupt the questioning with the police as to why he's being detained and why he's being questioned in the first place. I'm going to let you listen to the next eight minutes in, uh, uninterrupted for the sake of understanding the atmosphere of the interrogation room. After all, I think you've heard um, enough of my voice in the long intro, so I want you to grasp the atmosphere of this interrogation, and I think you're going to do it quite easily if you're paying attention. In any case, you'll hear my voice again after Marvin's first major slip-up. Okay. Look, now, when I seen the police, uh, I'm on probation. Mm -hmm. I know that. That's why I, when I seen them, I froze, and then I, um, no, I can't go back, so I took off. Okay. Where are you from? Originally, mm -hmm. South Carolina. And your sister Minnie lives in South Carolina? Yes, sir. Okay. You have a sister here locally who goes by, her name's Lizzie, but she goes by Angela? Mm hmm Okay. You have a girlfriend here? I have got a fiancé. What's uh, what's her name? Her name is Cassandra Valentin, Cassandra Hopkins Valentin. When was the last time you saw Cassandra? I seen her Sunday. Okay. Do you guys, were you guys living together? Yes, sir. What's that address? 2051 Frank E Avenue, Jacksonville, okay. 32208. You guys have a phone over there? She have a cell phone, I have a cell phone. Okay, what's your cell phone number? My cell phone number is 904-413-2502. I dropped my phone in water. Mm. That's why it's, it's, I can't even make a call. When did you drop in water? Uh, Monday. Monday? Monday evening, Monday morning. Around about... Six o'clock Monday morning. Okay, early in the morning. Mm -hmm. Do you work Monday or? No, I had an appointment. I had an appointment Monday because I couldn't go to work, and I couldn't call my my, my foreman mm -hmm. because of my phone. So. Okay. 
So you did work Monday. Did you work Tuesday? Yes, I did. And then you work today, of course. Uh, that's where you're at today. Who do you work for? Uh, I work for Ferber. Ferber. What, what do you guys do there? Sheet metal. Sheet metal work? Mm -hmm. Okay. Do you guys work like in different parts of the city? Uh, work all mm -hmm. over, but I'm at, you know, I'm at, working at St. Augustine. Oh, the hospital out there? Mm -hmm. How did you get there today? Uh, my brother, I catch right my brother every morning. He's your brother? Uh, not my biological brother, uh, Muslim brother. Okay, well, what's his name? Uh, his name is Joe. Joe? Joe, what's Joe's last name? Uh, Alfred. Alfred? Mm -hmm. Okay, so I, I don't hear well, so if I ask you, no, I'm not. What, uh, you rode with, with him in his car? Mm -hmm. What kind of car does he drive? He drives a black car. A black, black four-door. Black four-door? What kind? I don't know. You don't know what brand it is? Okay. Like older car or newer car? Uh, I don't know. I was probably 2000 or something like that. I don't know. Okay. All right, so you said last time you saw um, Cassandra, did you call her Sandy or? I call her Sweetie. Sweetie, okay. I'll, I'll call, I'm not going to call her Sweetie. So I'll, call her, I'll call her Cassandra for <laughs> well, see, you. See, that's, that's what I call her. Okay, okay. So you call her Cassandra. Last time you saw her was Sunday night. About what time was that? Uh, Around about... I said around about, what, 7.30, 8 o'clock, about the last time I seen her, because we had an argument. Mm -hmm. What was the argument about? Uh, because the Jags lost the football game. That was the argument was about. Are one of y'all Jags fans or one not? Or? Well, she's a New England fan, oh, okay. but she pulled for the Jags because it's Jacksonville. She's in Jacksonville, yes. and I'm a 49er fan. Okay. So that's what the argument started about, and then she went to reminiscing about um, – the past history that bet that's between us, mm -hmm. you know, that I, I just got out of prison for the Mexican buried on her. Mm -hmm. And numerous of, another time that I had been down here for the same thing. So she was reminiscing about that mm -hmm. and she caught a, a major attitude and we ah, 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 we arguing, we arguing back and forth, back and forth. So I said, you know what, I'm gone. I'll be, I'm gone. I'll be back about a week or two. Okay. And where'd you go? So I went downtown. Mm-hmm. I just walked around downtown Sunday night, rest of, rest of Sunday. Then I went to the shelter. What shelter did you go to? I went to Trinity. Okay. Trinity Shelter, Monday. It's a dude there named Debo. He gave me a courtesy and let me stay there Monday night. Okay, so you stayed there Monday night and then you and went then to let, Tuesday. And then let me stay there again last night. Okay. Um, during y'all's argument, Sunday night, 7 o'clock, you said 7 p.m., correct? Some of them, yes. Okay, somewhere around there. Um, was there any violence at all? Was she violent towards you? As uh, soon as I walked, I mean, because I was outside smoking mm -hmm. before the argument started. But when I came back in, as soon as I walked in, you know, she kind of pushed me. Mm -hmm. So I'm like, we started arguing, 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 arguing. So I left. Mm -hmm. But then as I was leaving, she said, well, I'm going to the Miss Merritt house. She went down to the store, got her some alcohol. Came back to Miss Mary. I was sitting at the bus station. Which was Miss Mary? Uh, it's an older lady that stays. The house sits here. There's a fence. At the back of the house, there's a fence. It's like an old, like a crab place here, but it's a big house here. Mm -hmm. It's right behind the house that sits right. If, if you see our house here, it's a house here. It's right directly behind the house on the right. On the same side we own, but it's just right directly behind the house. So is her house direct, the house directly on Edgewood? Because you got Frank Avenue right here. No, Edgewood's okay. out here. We stay on over here. Okay, we stay on Moncrief and Edgewood. Yeah, but y'all live on Frank. You e. live on Frank E. We stay on Frank E. Yeah, there's an auto parts store right or some kind of auto place right next yeah. to y'all. Yeah. So where where would that be? Okay, here's the auto place. Here's y'all's house. Here's Edgewood. Here's Frank. Where would it be now? I'm, I'm a little confused. Okay. The, uh, it's like a shed here, like an auto place that, yeah. yeah, yeah, it's right here. Our house, okay, If you, it's, the house is like this. Yeah, so this is the auto place, this is? This is our house here. Yeah. Okay. Now, there's another fence right beside, there's another house right beside us. Mm -hmm. Like, y'all go like right beside each other. Yeah, yeah. Like, but it's a fence that separates our house. Mm -hmm. Now, this memory house sits right behind the house that's on the other side of that fence. Mm -hmm. Just right behind me. Okay. Um, so then she, so you said she was headed over there, and then where, where'd you go from there? I, I went downtown. Okay. You, do you, how'd you get downtown? I caught the bus. You caught the bus. Do you remember which bus that is? The 3B. 
three B, and you got on that right there. Where's the bus stop at? Right there on the pl it's like the plaza. Uh, the little shopping center right there at Moncrief uh, and Edgewood. It's like Moncrief Lounge, liquor store, booty stop, stuff like that. Okay. Did you have the, Is there any connections there, or did you go straight downtown? Uh, once I got on the bus, I went straight down to the bus station. To the one on Union Street? Like Rose the big bus, the big bus station? Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, and then from there, where'd you go? I walked around town. I just walked, walked just mad. Like, why are we always arguing this and that and third? Mm -hmm. So I just stayed at that all night. Mm -hmm. I couldn't call I couldn't call my, uh, my phone. Like I said, I couldn't call my phone. When did your, when's your phone go? When did you drop your phone in the water? Monday. Mo Monday morning? Monday morning. About, you said about 6 o'clock? Mm -hmm. What about before then? Did you call anybody before then? Uh, I tried to make a, I tried to call her. I tried mm -hmm. to call her before I dropped my phone in the water. Okay. I tried to call her and she wouldn't answer the phone. I tried to call numerous times she wouldn't answer the phone. Mm -hmm. So I was sitting down at uh, him and Park. My phone was in my back pocket. Mm -hmm. That's when my phone went in the water. At him and Park? At him and Park. Okay, but you're able to get it back out. Is that what, is that the phone you have with you today? Uh -huh. And it's just not working. It's just not working. I'm I'm hoping that it dries out. Or I don't try to solely put it in rice. Put in rice. Yeah, I was about to say rice is usually what it's. I put it in rice. It they don't work. Did it completely submerge or did it just? It it went all the way under. Okay. Is it is there is it the fountain up there? Is that where it went in? Yeah. Okay. I thought there was a fountain up there. All right. Did you make any other calls between um, when you left Cassandra's and go to downtown? Well, I always, I always try to call my sister Minnie mm -hmm. and try to talk to her, mm -hmm. but she didn't answer her phone. Did you leave her a voicemail? Now, now listen, all the questions I'm asking, I know the answers to. Okay. Okay, so here we see Marvin being caught in a lie, and notice Marvin's head tilt. A head tilt like this implies suspicion. What he's doing here is essentially saying. Well, um, I know the detective is telling me that he thinks I'm lying, but I think they're bluffing. I think the police are bluffing. And if you notice his body language over the next three minutes, Marvin will continually make this head tilt pose. He does it later in the interrogation too, when he's not sure whether the detectives are telling the truth or not. But this is an important uh, piece of body language psychology you should pay attention to throughout this interrogation. Um, what I would like to know, okay, I know something bad happened, all right? I mean, I've talked, I've talked to your sister many, I mean, in South Carolina. I, I got back from South Carolina about 10 o'clock last night. Mm -hmm. uh, I've talked to your sister here, Lizzie or Angela. I'm, I'm not sure which, do you call her Lizzie or Angela? I call her Angie. Okay, Angie. Um, I've talked to her locally. I've seen the text message you sent her. I've listened to the voicemail that you left for me. Okay, so I know something bad happened. I know that you weren't downtown all uh, night. Okay, I, I know that. Yes, I were downtown. I, I can I can tell everywhere your phone was when you made those calls. Okay, I know you went downtown. I know the, the last place your phone hit on tower was downtown. I know all those answers, to all those questions. Okay, what I don't know is I don't know your mindset. Okay. I don't know if you maliciously planned something or something bad happened in the spur of the moment, but you know where I'm coming from, right? I mean, it, you got to know that I know all this, all right? And I'm giving you an opportunity to be up front as you can, okay? I know that you, at points you even contemplated taking your own life, okay? So obviously I know there's some regret there, okay? I know there's some feeling of sorrow, okay? Because I don't think that when you started out Sunday night that you planned on it ending the way it did, okay? I know for sure she was drinking, and I don't know about you, obviously, because I don't, I don't have a way of testing your blood from Sunday night, Monday morning. I don't know if you were drinking and things just went south, but I know things went south, okay? And they went a lot further south than her just pushing you. So the question today is, are you going to be honest? Or are you going to sit here and, and, and tell lies? All right? 
Listen, I went up and talked to Minnie, and he's been praying for you. Minnie's biggest concern was that you were going to either hurt yourself or you were going to force us to hurt you. And I assure her that's not what we want to do, okay? What I wanted to do is happening right now. I want to sit across the table from you and talk to you, okay? I don't harbor any ill feelings for you. The, the, I tell you who I feel sorry for. The sorriest I feel for in all of this is your sister Minnie. Okay? She had to listen to that message and worry about you for two or three days. Okay? And I've called and left her a message, but she didn't get off work till three. So she probably hadn't got that message yet. So where, where are we going to be? Did you make a mistake and things went, went south? At this point, Marvin knows he's been caught in a lie. The detective played it quite smartly here. He probably recognized Marvin's psychological issues and with a simple phrase, did you make a mistake? Gives Marvin a chance to state that he's lying without hurting his ego. After Marvin takes the bait, you'll notice his head tilting disappears. He knows he's been placed at the scene of the crime and he now must move on to his plan B. That is, if he even had a plan B. He might be winging it. But anyway, his plan B, whether planned or winged, is extremely absurd. Just get a load of this whopper of a story. Yeah. Okay. Let's start over. What happened? I was drinking. The internal world of a control freak, that is, the, the mentally internal world, the world he sees from his perspective, a control freak's world and the objective external world are at great odds. For a control freak, he is beyond blame as long as his actions are externally motivated. This is why Martin states that he was drinking. He believes that this helps excuse his actions in the police's eyes, which is strange. But for a control freak, the way he thinks is kind of the way everyone else thinks. At least that's how he, he believes the world to work. Also, can we give a second to appreciate the second detective who has been quiet the entire time? I have seen way too many interrogations be ruined by a second person who, for some reason, is compelled to speak, interrupting the questioning and ruining the atmosphere when the suspect is on the ropes. You know, a minute told me not to train it over because I can't handle it. Mm -hmm. And it's like it enhances my, my attitude. Mm -hmm. So once we started arguing, it's like a rage just came out. And what happened? First, we got out of the argument. I left. She come out the door. I said, where you going? I'm going, I'm going to get me some drink. So she went down to Monk Creek Lobbies. I followed behind her. She got it. She got her, her, her wine. She went over to Miss Mary House. She said she was going to Miss Mary House just to chill out with Miss Mary because she called her grandpa. So I tried to call her. I told her, I said, you know what, it's over with. You want to choose drinking over me, this and the third, da 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 da. But I'm just tripping. I ain't saying that it's over. Oh, I'm just. You're just upset. Yeah, because, you know, if I, I get upset, I'm going to say some stuff. I'm going to say some things and get that out of the way. So when she came home, I finally came home. But she, she left her key in the door. So I'm like, why is your key in the door? Oh, I left it there for a reason. I said, what's the reason? And then she started the argument back from the previous argument. 
So what happened was is that the argument got heated some more, heated some more. She went and grabbed the knife. I took it from her. And that was, that was the end of it. I find it slightly amusing that he thinks if he says that's the end of it, the questioning will stop. And that's the end of it. This is a phrase, if you think about it, that parents use with their children when they don't want to justify decisions they've made for their kids. And Marvin definitely has used this speech in his abusive relationship with Cassandra. Unfortunately for Marvin, this phrase I definitely do not doubt that Marvin has used this speech, this phrase specifically, in his abusive relationship with Cassandra. Unfortunately for Marvin though, this phrase used as an attempt to end his story right before the actual killing of Cassandra is not effective with the police. Cassandra might fear to press an issue after she hears this phrase used by Marvin, but the police are not. Where were y'all at when she got the knife? It was in the hallway. Okay. And when you took it from her, what was she doing? She was struggling, trying not to give it to me, get, not trying to give it to me. And she was being resistant, and she fell. I fell on top of her. What point did you get the knife? When I fell on top of her, because I had grabbed it like this, the handle pulled from her. So once I grabbed it, she was pulling. She was pulling, so I'm telling her, let it go, let it go. So when she done, instead of got a, a put a little grip to it, I'm stronger than she is. I mean, obviously, you're, you're a big dude, she's a, um, I'm strong to see. Even after discussing the passing of his lover, Martin can still laugh and smile in response to a compliment. We should all strive to be so positive in the face of tragedy. Yeah, so I'm trying to have so I'm really I'm kinda like having fun. Mm -hmm. You know. So I loosen up and I said, You want a knife that bad? Hmm, you can have it. But I still got the hammer part. Mm-hmm. When she pulled, she got the blade part towards her, towards her. So when she pulled... Where was she grabbing at on the knife? She was grabbing like... The detective asks about this little detail because he knows that Cassandra was found with no wounds on her hands. By answering this question in the affirmative, Marvin again gives the prosecution evidence that his story is a lie. Control freaks and narcissists typically will craft lies to fill in the details of the story so as to better control the narrative making it seem as though they have complete knowledge of the occurrence. To a control freak and to a narcissist, the admission of, knack, of a lack of knowledge, such as in the form of a simple, I don't know, is seen as weakness. To a control freak or to a narcissist, the admission of a lack of knowledge, such as in the form of a simple, I don't know, is seen as weakness. Hence, those with personality disorders of these types have a strong tendency toward revealing themselves via the admission of superfluous lies and their stories. I got the handle, mm -hmm. like one hand, but it's still some more handle there. Mm -hmm. So she grabbed that part there. So she's she, grabbing the handle and the blade? Yeah. So when she slipped, we both fell. Mm -hmm. And I land on top of her with a knife in my hand. Mm -hmm. And what happened? And she, she was hollering. I'm like, what you hollering for? So I looked. The knife was in her. Where at in her? It was somewhere on, on, in her stomach. So I just, I pulled it up. And she was saying, baby, I'm dying, baby, I'm dying. Mm -hmm. I panicked. Then what happened? 
she said that we're supposed to be getting married in June. Mm -hmm. Only thing is when I pulled a knife out, I panicked so hard till and I told her, ain't nobody gonna believe this. Ain't nobody gonna believe that you slept and I fell on top of you. Imagine stabbing your lover in the stomach, one of the most painful places to be stabbed. Think about that for a second. What's your natural reaction? Is it that no one's gonna believe that it was an accident? Well, that's Marvin's first thought. But think of it this way. Even a person without a medical background, like me, knows that a stab wound is not fatal if you treat it quickly because the stomach's just not a important part in regulating your body really quickly, right? So typically a stomach stab wound leads to death only via sustained blood loss. It's not the wound itself that kills. So if you love someone really deeply and you accidentally stab that person in the stomach, uh, your first concern is probably to assist that person in seeking medical attention. That is, unless you have the imprecise medical knowledge and you believe that the stomach wound's actually gonna kill, like a stab to the heart. In that case, you might act like Marvin. But Marvin's story is just ridiculous. Look, his story implies that he believes a stomach wound is quickly fatal. However, if you listen to what happens later in the interrogation, you'll find that even this implied belief is a lie. He knows that the stomach wound can be treated. Mm -hmm. At this point, uh, the wound right here, and it's just right in the stomach. Somewhere up in here. Mm -hmm. So I'm like, ain't nobody gonna believe this. Mm -hmm. First thing they're gonna look at is our history together. The battery. And you're having this conversation with her at this point? Yes. Okay. And then I want to think about me going back to prison. Mm -hmm. I panicked. No, I haven't. She was like, I want to ask you something. And I'm looking in your face and tell you this. This is what she said to me. Finish me off. I told her no. So baby do it. I'm tired. I want to go home. The best interrogators are those who know when to be silent. The detectives are really letting Martin hang himself here. Think of the logic of this story. Cassandra also erroneously believes that the stab wound is fatal. Instead of pleading for help, she requests a quick death. But this in itself is a contradiction. Marvin, in this story, is implying that Cassandra believes a stomach stab wound is a death sentence, but also that its death occurs slowly. So she somehow understands that the stomach is not a vital organ, yet she also believes that she's beyond medical attention. Marvin, through his absurd story, displays myriad logical inaccuracies and inconsistencies for both the detectives and the recording in the room, most certainly damning himself in court. Also. Is it not absurd that Marvin wants us to believe that the whole conversation is happening on the ground? Recall that this conversation is occurring immediately after both Marvin and Cassandra fell to the floor. Imagine falling on your lover, resulting in a knife being plunged into her stomach, and then the two of you just chill on the ground chatting. If you love me, finish it. We can see the control freak side of Marvin in statements like these. He didn't honor Cassandra's first request to take her life, but only acted after she gave him an ultimatum. He had to stab her to prove that he loved her, basically. 
And again, this goes back to control freaks only engaging in egregious behavior when outside circumstances force them into it. Who knows if he would have stabbed Cassandra had she not phrased her request in such a way. In the worldview of a control freak, this story makes perfect sense. But to the detectives and to anyone listening, this story is cartoonishly fake as most of us do not believe in a true lack of agency. I was scared. I did what she asked me. That's when I text my sister. Was she just laying there at that point? She wasn't fighting anymore? How many times do you think you stabbed her? After that falling, went like three. Three times, three more times. Where'd the knife end up? In her neck. Is that when it broke? In Marvin's own story, his mercy kill sounds quite painful. Three stabs in the neck with force strong enough to break the knife. Upon seeing such a scene without context, You'd be more likely to label it a cartel beheading than a mercy kill. Yeah. Is there anything else? When you, then you text your sister. You text Minnie. I left the house. I'm sorry, you text Lizzie. I left the house. I went downtown. I text, I text Angie. First, I, I think I called her. I, can, I think I called her, but then I texted and told her. I said I did something stupid. Wasn't my intentions. I did something stupid. It is odd that Marvin would admit that he did something stupid here. Prior to this, his actions were either out of compassion or out of being intoxicated. Now it seems as though he's admitting a mistake. Marvin really is all over the place in this interrogation, and I'm sure his lawyer facepalmed multiple times while watching this the first time through. And that's in a text message? Did you call Minnie too, or? I called my brother David. He didn't answer the phone. Did you leave him a message, or did you just call him? I left him a message too. Uh, I called mom, tried to call mom to tell her. Uh, she went not answer her phone. I called Minnie, so Minnie didn't answer her phone, so I left her a voice message. Mm -hmm. Cause she's like a sister that I can talk to about anything. She's a good lady. I can talk to her about anything. Mm -hmm. Did you ever actually talk to anybody about it? About what happened? Mm -hmm. Never actually spoke and spoke with anybody. It was all just the text message and the voice, the voicemails. Um, take a second because this phone's a little slow. the message you left um left me your family is worried about you and I'll you know I'll call I already called and left a message for many but I'll call Lizzie when we get out of here. Is that a text message that you um you sent to Angie?
when she was laying there after she got stabbed the first time, um, You had control of the knife, right? At that point, you have the knife in your hand, and she's let loose of it, and that's when she's telling you to finish her. I had pulled the knife out of the stomach. Mm -hmm. Where were, what was she doing with her hands at that point? She just, like, relaxed, she, or once she... It, once I pulled the knife out, she covered up, covered up warm. I said, baby, let me see. Mm -hmm. I offered, I said, baby, let me get some ice or something to put on to slow the bleeding down. Mm -hmm. She said, no. She said she was tired, she was ready to go home with her grandmother and her son. Were you standing up at that point or were you? I was kneeling on one knee. One knee, and then she was on her kind of side to lean back. Um, I mean, obviously at that point, you're in fear of going to jail, correct? And that's why. And then she's saying to finish her. I mean, do you think it, at that point there was some, a better decision to be made? I mean, do you think stand up and call 911? You know, uh, Detective, I've been on a long road with her. Yes, sir. I loved her. Mm -hmm. I fought so hard to get back with her while where we was at. Yes, sir. So do you really think that I wanted to do that? And I'm sitting here, and I'm sitting here looking at you dead in your eyes. Do you really think that I wanted to do that? To her? Yes. No. No, I think you got upset and something bad happened. I don't she begged me, sir. She begged me to do this. She begged you to, to kill her? Because she was tired. After that, that knife went in her, she was tired. I mean, do, do you think that, I mean, still, I mean, do you still think, like, we're sitting here right now today, do you think that was the right decision? No, it wasn't the right decision. That, that's what I was asking. It was not the right decision. I mean, do you think the, the right decision would have been to call 914 to get her some attention for the, the stab wound? I mean, obviously, you would have had to deal with what you got to deal with anyways, but and we're still sitting here dealing with that. Man, I've, still been, I've still been sitting right here. Yeah. She probably would have lived from the, the first wound. I would have been sitting right here having the same conversation with you. But she would have been alive. If you are not familiar with the mind of a control freak, you would likely be confused by Marvin's line of statements here. The detective is arguing that if Marvin would have sought medical attention for his girlfriend instead of stabbing her three times in the neck, she would probably be alive today. However, Marvin simply keeps repeating that the situation would not have changed. While illogical, this is the mind of a control freak. Ultimately, the reasons that led him to the police interrogation room were always out of his control. He was forced to stab Cassandra in his mindset. Control freaks' mistakes are always due to external circumstances, and murder is no exception. And that's what I mean. I mean, it's, there were some better decisions to be made. Um, she had no defensive wounds on her hands. She had no cuts on her hands. I know she did. And that's why I'm a little skeptical about the part where she's grabbing. You got the handle in your hand, and she's grabbing. She, I have never seen anyone get stabbed where they grabbed a blade and didn't get their hand cut. So I'm asking you, man to man, and you know. And I'm telling you, man to man. You do did, see she, that? did she? Did she? Because obviously, obviously, you understand that. Yes, I do. That she had the knife at first. If 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 all this is true, she had the knife at first. You're obviously a, a big guy. You were able to take that knife from her, and during that struggle, she gets stabbed. Okay, but then you have control of the knife. At that point, you're not in fear for your life anymore. You're in fear of getting in trouble, but and you're in fear about what happened, but you're not in fear for your life. So there's no self-defense at that point. Correct. After that, it wasn't. Yeah, after after the first stab wound, there's no self-defense. Everything you did after that is a whole separate... You could have stopped right there, called 911, and she probably lives, okay? Yeah, but she, but she told you that stuff, and, and you did it. So whether she had the knife at the beginning or not doesn't change the fact about charges and things like that. So that's why I want to make sure all of that part's true, okay? Did she have the knife first? Did you really wrestle it from her? Or 
did it happen a different way? She had the knife first. Okay. And every, everything you told me today is 100% correct. Yes, sir. She tried to grab it from the top. Somehow she doesn't get cut other than, than the stab here. Well, I, listen, this is a knife. Mm -hmm. She got a knife. When I wrestled it from her, I got this much of the handle. Okay, so there's like this much handle left. There's more handle left. Yeah. It's so a, she has more of a handle than the blade. She, she has more of a handle than, than some parts of the blade. Okay. When she pulled, she lost her slipping. Mm -hmm. Both of you are standing up at this point. Yeah. Because she's been drinking. Mm -hmm. She lost her balance. Mm -hmm. And I fell with her. The blade pointed like this. I'm mm -hmm. 235, 240. I landed on top of it like this. How far did the blade go into that time? Uh, I think to the handle. How about the other stab wounds? I don't know how far they went in. I, don't, I really don't. What do you... The last thing I remember from what she telling me before. That before the next the next step was kiss me. I bent down to her, she said I love you and thank you. And I and, and I kissed her. This story just gets increasingly absurd. So at this point, Marvin's story is that Cassandra slipped while wrestling with Marvin for control of the knife leading to the knife being fully buried in their stomach. At that point, they both lay on the floor. Marvin tells Cassandra that no one will ever believe that this was an accident. Okay, and then Cassandra conveniently tells Marvin to finish her off, even using the phrase, if you love me, you'll do it. We are then to assume that a look in Marvin's eye as he still lying on top of Cassandra, face to face, tells Cassandra that he'll do it. Once Cassandra sees that look, she says to Marvin, kiss me. He does, and they tell each other, I love you. Then Cassandra says, goodbye. And Marvin upholds his promise, stabbing Cassandra in the neck three times with a violence strong enough to break the knife. All while, by the way, lying on the floor. If this were a movie scene, critics would be calling it unrealistic. Yet Marvin and his delusions think his statements are convincing enough for a police interrogation. That was after the, the one in the neck? That was before that one. That was between the other ones and the neck? Okay. I'm sorry, I'm not sure. Before the neck one? Mm -hmm. That's what she asked me. That's what she was telling me. Okay. After the chest, before the neck. Okay. And then you kissed her and then stabbed her in the neck. When I kissed her, I said, I love you. She said, I love you too. And she said, goodbye. Did you get, did you receive any injuries while you were trying to take the knife? Did you get cut at all or anything like that? I mean, I, I know you got some nicks and stuff now, but I'm assuming that's from no, today. This, this comes from working. work. Okay. I mean, working, the nicks, the, the cut, stuff yeah. like that comes from me, the, the sheet metal, stuff like that. Yeah. Okay, but you didn't get injured at all no. during any of that. What do you think, if you were on the outside looking at this, what do you think should happen to you? What I think should be what should happen to me, mm -hmm. I should join. Okay. I know you made some threats about that, but I mean, if you were, do you, do you think? I mean, obviously, you think what you did was wrong, correct? It was not the right thing to do. Yes, yeah, she's the love of my life. Yeah. Did you guys have any other? I mean, I know obviously we have one other, that one other violent incident. Was there any other ones? We had a violent incident in. Uh, I first hit her in 11, 12, and then I went to prison in 13. Were the other ones documented, the 2011 and 12? Were the police called on those, or was it just the, uh, the jail? 
the police weren't calling 11. I think the police was calling 12, and it was calling 13. When they called in 13, I went to prison. That's the one you went to prison for four years for. The one in 11, what was that incident? What, what happened? Uh, it was that she got to call some men. And you know, uh, I got the hot head. Mm -hmm. So I asked her, so where she been at? And the dude was like, where he at? Where he at? I said, I'm right here. He got in his truck and left. So we had some physical altercations. Was it just hands that time? Were there anything else involved? Or? It was just hands. Okay. Was she injured at all? Or? Uh, she had a, a, a busted lip. Okay. How about you? Do you have any injuries? Or? What about the 2012 incident? Uh, she got injured pretty bad. She was injured pretty bad in that one. Did you, the police were called in that? The, uh, she still she still got uh, documentation, pictures and stuff of 12 and 13. Okay, so 12 and 13, the police were called. The 13 being yeah. an incident that you went to jail. And that one's, I know about that one, so you know, I don't have to rehash that one. Um, Didn't we have this conversation about 13 last year? I mean, in me 13? and you? Yeah. No, no. I only work homicides. I only work deaths. Oh, okay. So no, I wasn't involved in, in any of that other stuff. Um, have you ever... Has this been a problem your entire life, violence towards women, or is it just with her? No, I ain't never had a problem with violence towards women. Matter of fact, when I was locked up in South Carolina, I was against uh, my sister's husband because he used to jump on her. Mm -hmm. And I didn't know my Minnie's husband was doing the same thing, so uh, I was I was against that when I got out. You know, um, yeah. my mind frame switched when my grandfather passed in 92. Mm -hmm. Then my father passed in 97. Now, I'm locked up now. I got locked up in 95. Yeah. My father died in 97, my grandmother in 99, and then a host of relatives that was constantly passing as the years went by. Now, your, um, your sister was telling me that you were raised by your dad at least part of the time while she was raised by mom. I was raised by my grandma. Gra well, she said grandma, but you were officially with dad or something. I was you got back with dad. I was officially, I mean, my grandmother had custody of me. Mm -hmm. My dad, he stayed there, but my grandmother had custody of me. Okay, because, yeah, she said that the girls stayed with mom and the boys went with dad. Um, uh, uh, two, my two older brothers went with dad. Mm -hmm. I continued to stay with grandma. You stayed with grandma when, yeah. he, when the other two left. Um, was there any abuse in the house when you were a kid or? Mm -mm. You were never abused physically, mentally, sexually, anything like that. There's never any problems in the house. You feel mm -hmm. like you had a good childhood, as good as you could have with a with the situation that was going on. Mm -hmm. My grandparents gave me just about everything I could ever ask for, and not even, and sometimes not even ask. Okay. Did you go to school? Mm -hmm. How far did you go to school? Uh, I supposed to graduated in November the fifteenth from FCC. For HVAC. Okay, that's recently. Um, but like in, you went to elementary school, obviously, middle school or junior high, and then high school. When did you quit going to school at that point? I really didn't quit going to school. I quit going to day school. Okay. I went to going to night school. Did you graduate? Yeah. Okay, so you did get, you did end up graduating. Um, good student, no problems? Well, I was a good student. I ain't gonna say I'm not a student, but I was a good student. No, no learning disabilities, no issues like that, no, no mental issues, anything like that would have held you back. Mm. Not that I know about no mental issues, not. I ain't never been had a cycle of evaluation. Okay. You didn't have anything while you were in prison in South Carolina. They didn't offer anything. Well, they they tried to give me they scheduled me to talk to like two psych doctors, but they said there ain't nothing wrong with me. So. Okay. By this point, the detective has pretty much everything he wants. And the whole line of questioning is to document Marvin not having any childhood trauma, mental issues, or learning disabilities that could potentially impact a guilty verdict in court. Marvin is unaware of this and he answers in line with uh, strengthening his own ego. So he's basically giving the police what he wants because he feels good with these answers. Had he remained quiet, 
his lawyer might have been able to dig something up from his past so as to garner sympathy with a jury, but he blew that chance just because of his ego. Again, props to the other detective who remained silent due to realizing things were going really well. Um, we're gonna step out real quick and we'll make sure there's, there's nothing else. Do you need anything else? You want a bottle of water? Or? Uh, yes, sir. Okay, let me grab you something. thing I want to go over with you is a consent to search for your phone. I know you said it wouldn't start up, but you know we have some computer technicians that may be able to figure that out. Um, if you would, will you read that form over? And then if you agree to everything there, if you will initial there, there, and sign there. If you have any questions along the way, let me know. It's a pretty, uh, pretty long form. So. Uh, initial there, if you agree, initial there, 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 and sign there. What if I disagree? Then you can not sign. I mean, that's, that's up to you, man. We're not, I'm not forcing anything on you. I'm not here to browbeat you or be mean to you or anything like that. It's, it's a free decision you have to make. Um, I, don't, I, mean, I don't feel like you're trying to hide anything or anything like that. So. Um, the other form I want to go over with you is a consent for cheek swabs DNA. Uh, I know that your DNA is probably already in the system. This just makes a little one-to-one -one matches a little faster, a little easier. Um, same thing. It's a form. Just read it. If you have any questions, ask me. And when you're done, if you consent to that, if you will sign right there. And just like that other form, you have every right not to sign. So you so you saying that every time I made a phone call, the tower picked up on it. Mm-hmm. And that's separate. This, this is a DNA cheek swap uh -huh. thing. But yeah, every time you make a phone call, it hits a tower. So basically, if you're sitting right here and you make a phone call, it's going to bounce to a tower. Um, if you move, if you drive 10 miles that way and call call somebody again, it's going to hit another tower. And then it gives you a direction of where it's at and that type of thing. So when was the last time I made a phone call? The last phone call, from what I'm being told, was around 4 something in the morning, and you were downtown on Monday morning. They hit off the tower right there near the Main Street Bridge. There's one on top of one of those buildings over there. Now that's what, as far as I know, I haven't went through and looked myself, but that's what I was told. Does that sound correct to you? 4 o'clock. Now sometimes, sometimes that stuff's in different time zones, so it could be an hour off, depending on what the company, the time zones the companies put them in. And I'm not sure if the person who looked checked that. So it could be off by an hour or so, 
depending on the time zone. If it's like either their company's in central time zone, sometimes they'll put those times in central and you got to convert them. Um, your phone, does it have a code? Okay. What's the code? Is it like a number or is it like the one with the dots where you draw it? It's a word. It's a word? Okay. You'd be willing to give me that word? Gray. Gray? G R A Y? Mm -mm. No. G R E Y. G -R oh. All lowercase or uppercase or? Or does it matter? Lowercase. Okay. The rest of the interrogation footage is administrative. But if you're interested in the psychology of a control freak, you'll find a lot interesting here. Consider the otherwise insignificant exchange of Marvin's phone password. Marvin is holding on to his sense of control during the entire exchange, as long as he possibly can. The detectives here have to coax the password out of Marvin, while Marvin leans back in his chair and smugly corrects the detectives on their wrong guesses. Nearly 30 seconds go by before the detectives get the full password. Imagine that. You ask me for my password, and I just spell it out for you. That's, what, a five-second exchange? But with Marvin, a control freak, it takes 30 seconds because he needs to grasp onto that sense of control. And throughout these 30 seconds, Marvin flaunts his control over his password by being as vague as possible and by engaging in length of silence. This is the same psychology outwardly expressed by toddlers who have just gained what psychologists term theory of mind. The ability to know that your knowledge is yours exclusively. This is around the age when children create imaginary friends and fantastical stories and they refuse to directly answer their parents' questions. Parents might view Marvin's actions and see them as childish, but Really, he's just a control freak attempting to hold on to his last few opportunities to actually be in control of something. What's that? What's that from? Most people associate with something in my gray. That's my grandmother's maiden name. Okay. He's got to check, collect those cheek swaps for me real quick. Hey, the clothes you were wearing that night, is it the clothes you have on? Or hmm? The clothes that you were wearing the night? The the incident occurred? Is it the clothes you have on now? No. Where are the clothes you were wearing that night? I don't, I don't remember. You don't remember? Okay. Zip it up. Shoes, shoes. Are those the shoes you're wearing at night, or no, my white sneakers. Your white sneakers. You know where they ended up? Yeah, oh. they were the ones that were at the house. Okay. Um, do you think you threw your clothes away, or you're wearing, or? Current things to do. Um, I'm gonna get you a uniform to change into a jail uniform. A couple more what things to do? You said you had a couple more things to do. House cleaning things. Basically, that means like paperwork, ten things like that. Uh, one of those things is we're gonna get you some cho clothes to change into, and we'll have an evidence technician just come take some photographs of you. Uh, they'll take photographs of your hands, uh, any injuries you have, any injuries you don't have. Um, and once we're done with that, we'll get you next door. Do you have any questions? Is there anything I can do for you? Uh, within reason, obviously. Um, anybody you want me to call and tell anything to, other than, you know, obviously I told you to call Minnie and I'd call your sister. And I'm sure they'll take care of calling most of the other families or anybody else. You want me to call and let them know anything? Or... Hmm. 
So how can I get my check down here? You what? How can I get my check down here? From your the company you work at? Mm -hmm. um, is there somebody I can call over there and tell? I mean, what do you want to happen to it? Who do you want to end up with your check? Me. I want to be in my account here. In your account here? Um, would somebody better take care of that for you? Because I can't put it on your account, but somebody else, if you have a family member, maybe I can tell them to send it to your workplace and get that and put it on your account. And would you want me to call Lizzie and have her? No. No, not her. Your boy Joe, is he close enough to somebody you trust or? Can I use the phone? Uh, who you need to call? Um. I mean, you'll better use the phone over there. I it's, mean, it's free and holding. How long uh, would it take you to get in my phone? To get in your phone? Probably with it being having damage, probably days. Mm. Uh, I'm trying to figure it. You don't know the number. It's in my phone. Uh, yeah, if, if it was as easy as plugging it up, I'd plug it in and we'll get your number for you. But eight six four three six. Oh. Well, sit sit here and think about it. Um, is there anything you, else now? No, we're we're towards the end. Like I said, now this technician will come. We're waiting on them to get here, and they'll take photographs of you. Um, other than that, I mean, I don't think I think everything's out on the table. I mean, I think you've you said what you what you what you you're going to say, and I think we went over everything that we need to go over. Uh, do you have any questions? When you ask me. What I should think, what, what, I, what, what I think should happen to me. Mm -hmm. Do you, what I, what I was meaning was, maybe that was phrased poorly. Uh, let me think of another way to phrase it. Um, if you were on the outside viewing everything that happened, you could be an all-seeing eye. And you saw everything for exactly how it happened. And you saw somebody do this to somebody. It's not you, it's somebody else. And what do you think should happen to the person that did something like this? Do you think what they did is right and that they shouldn't be punished? Do you think they should be punished and go to jail? Do you think they should be punished more harshly? I mean, I, that's what I'm asking you. If you were and I'll see, if you were standing here and you just saw all this happen, you saw a guy and a woman get in a fight, you see her with a knife, you see him take, you see everything, just like you just told me. What do you think should happen to death penalty? Death, death penalty? Mm -hmm. And that's what I was asking. Maybe it was poorly worded. It's kind of a complicated question, a little bit more complicated than... No, because I kind of know what she was talking about. Okay. That's, that's what I was asking. What do you think should happen? Mm -hmm. You think you, you, So you would think that if somebody did this, they should get the death penalty. Mm -hmm. why, why do you think that? Because even though that person uh, said, let's say, that that person said they go ahead, they're tired, they want to go home, no, even if the person asked him to do it. Should have done. 911 was the best call, but like I said, she she said she was tired. She was ready to go. Yeah. And that was a poor judgment. But at the time, you thought it was the right thing to do. I mean, that's... Yeah. But, like I said... Hindsight's 20, 20 man. It's, you know, we make some of us, we make bad decisions in split seconds. I mean, everybody does it. And I'm pretty sure that the family's going to seek for the death penalty. So, yeah, I mean, I wouldn't, I wouldn't, I wouldn't be surprised. I, mean, I wouldn't either. So, I'm ready to get it over with. Okay. All right. Let me, uh, let me get that evidence taken. We'll get those photographs and we'll get you in there. Yeah, yeah um, we're going to change real quick first. Um, She's gonna get some photographs of you first, and then we'll get you changed, and then we'll I'll get you to the bathroom. What is that? Gel clothes. Gel clothes. Clothes. Can you stand there with your back on. You can wait real quick. We'll get you some bigger ones when we get over there, but that's all we have for right now. I cannot get in there. You don't think so? Well, we'll try. <laughs> we'll see. We'll see what we can do. This is the second time in an interrogation that lasts under one hour, in which Marvin shows pride about how big he is. It's quite likely he has narcissistic personality traits. His size isn't a bodybuilder's size. <clears throat> that is, it's not the size that came from effort in the gym. His large stature instead is genetic. It's a circumstance of birth.
and pride in these traits, traits you can't control, is often a narcissistic trait. Marvin also continues to flaunt the little control he has by telling police officers that they are ill-equipped to properly clothe him. Can I just look at me? It'll be, it'll, whatever it is, it'll be something you're wearing for like 10 minutes till you get over there. I am going to get in that shirt. Okay. Face that way for me. Face the wall for me. Face the other wall for me. If you would go ahead and have a seat right there, and put your hands on. Um, just, you have any, you have any injuries on your chest, back, anything like that? Probably something from when he tased me. Okay, well you take your shirt off and she'll take some pictures of you real quick. And they had no cuffs too tight. Yeah, I see you. Uh huh? I saw your wrist. Do you have silver surgery at some point or is that just an injury? That's it. A knife stab. When you were in jail or outside? When I was in prison. Did you convert while you were in prison or after? No, I was supposed to have did when I was on the street. I got locked up somewhere and took it in while I was in. No injuries on your chest? No, ma'am. Okay. All right. You can have a seat. Um, yeah, that is not going to fit. <laughs> we just humor you, just try it, just see if it doesn't fit, we'll work on getting you something else. Like I said, it's a temporary thing. It wouldn't be the permanent thing you're going to wear over there. Um, but it will expedite us getting you over there. <laughs> Take it off, man. <laughs> Again, Marvin attempts to wrestle some control from the detectives. He hesitates to even attempt to put on the shirt, essentially saying, I know I won't fit in this. Like, what are you, stupid? When he actually puts the shirt over his head, however, it seems as though he could pull it down over his torso quite easily. At this point, the detective just gives up, seemingly to avoid trouble. Indeed, once you recognize a control freak in real life, it's better to avoid confrontations than to call them out because you'll never have a harmonious ending to the interaction. The detective's goal at this point is just to get Marvin to holding and he's thinking probably, okay, if you want a bigger shirt, we'll get you a bigger shirt, whatever will get you to the next step in processing. The detective's job is done at this point and I'm sure he just wants to call it a day and go home. You gotta go to father now. How about the pants? See what you think of those and then we'll... Think they're too small too? Okay. Marvin doesn't even attempt to try on the pants. He's feeling in control, as you can tell from the smug look he gives the detective. However, that would be the last smug look he makes in the free world and his last act of agency was to reject a pair of pants. That will be the legacy he brings to prison. In the end, this really is a story of control. Think about the entire situation. 
we have a man who is obsessed with maintaining a sense of control. Yet, he loses control over something as simple as a football game, prompting him to stab his lover of many years, not just once, but four times, and with enough force to break the knife. Every action Marvin performed after the stabbing was with the goal of recapturing some semblance of control. From running from the police, to rejecting the prison clothes because of their size, this is a man with such a strong need for the feeling of personal agency that he's willing to kill, and our justice system let him slip through, even though he's previously demonstrated that he has no respect for the agency of others. Perhaps this case serves as an example of a need for a harsher punishment for domestic violence. Or perhaps this case is an example of the need for a psychological counseling for those with control issues. Or maybe it's an example of the need for interventions in abusive relationships. After all, Cassandra frequently dropped the domestic battery charges and restraining orders against Marvin. I don't really know. All I know is that this case was many things. But personally, as a student of psychology, I'd have to say the biggest takeaway here from this perspective is the insight into the mind of a control freak, specifically the delusional belief that others will believe the control freak's lies as long as the negative aspects of his life occur outside of his control. In the end, we hear a laughably absurd story of a man accidentally stabbing his lover falling to the floor, and remaining in that position, with the first words out of his mouth being, ain't nobody gonna believe this. And according to his story, she had plenty of time to react by screaming, requesting medical help, or even just logically responding to that statement he made with something like, oh, what the hell are you talking about? Ain't nobody gonna believe this. I'm still alive. I'll just tell the truth, and you won't get in trouble. So long as I get medical help, I need to survive. So get some medical help for me and you'll be fine. I'll tell people it's an accident. But instead of doing these things, oh, she just, you know, gave up on living, saying, I'm tired. If you really love me, you'll kill me. Bye bye. That is not the story of an idiot, but the story of a person who does not share the same reality as you or me. There are people out there in the world just like this, all around us. And I think that's the lesson we got to take away from this story. Never assume that those around you, no matter how sane they seem, look at the world the same way as you do. Thank you for watching this video all the way to the end. I just want to leave a few words here for you. Uh, just two things to say, really. First of all, this is only my second video of this type of content. I was encouraged to make this because of the surprisingly, overwhelmingly positive response from my first video, even though I wasn't really too proud of that video. Um, I hope you think this one is of higher quality than the last one, and I'd really love to receive your feedback on whether you think I should keep making videos of this type, because this is not why I started my YouTube channel, and this is kind of, this type of content is kind of outside of uh, my area of comfort. And second, I just want to give a, a really quick shout out to uh, Matt Orchard, who gave me a lot of good advice on making this sort of content. If you're not familiar with him, he makes some of the best JCS style content, barring JCS himself. He's really objective with how he portrays his cases, and he gives unique commentary, which I find increasingly rare with uh, the JCS style content these days, as a lot of creators just kind of seem to give the same interrogation talking points parroted from JCS. His most recent video was on uh, John Bernay Ramsey, and it shows all three, four actually, if you break it down completely, all, all four theories on who killed her. I really suggest you check that out. Um, I'm gonna put the link in the description below, so check that out. Anyway, thanks for watching. And do let me know if you think I should continue with this sort of content or go back to what I was doing before. 
I mean, I, I honestly don't know. I need your feedback. But thank you. <sighs> and that hurts. What's up? You want to hit the cuffs on too tight? Yeah. <clears throat> Let me get some walking over there, right? No, no, what's it? You, yeah, you want to just drive over there? Yeah, it don't matter. I need to walk. I mean, what's in here? Very close. Okay. Do you need us or in? no? No? All right. All right. We'll take you over there. Where are the shoes at? 